The circular economy has become a crucial topic in the sustainability agenda within the last decade. This documentary recounts four stories from different contexts chosen by the Just to See Research Project in Italy, Portugal, Ghana, and South Africa, with the aim of better understanding what does it mean an inclusive, sustainable, and socially just transition to a circular economy. Taranto, 200,000 people, is the home to the ex Ilva, one of the biggest and oldest steel-making plants in Europe. Since 1960s, Ex Ilva's extensive production and employment capacity strongly influenced the territory's development. It caused several fatal accidents, led to severe pollution and a public health crisis in the surrounding area, compromising any alternative economic possibility. Here, Liberi e Pensanti Committee proposed a citizen-lead circular economic strategy for the transition of the entire city of Taranto to a circular economy, away from its polluting steel-making monoculture. This strategy is named Piano Tanto. If we talk about Ilva, we can say uh, that as an area uh, of uh, 15 million uh, square meters, more twice than the size of the city of Taranto itself, Ilva is also called the factory of death, in according to the numbers reported on the cancer registry. Lack of safety in uh, production practices uh, have caused many accidents. Finally, in uh, 2012, the judge Patrizia Todisco ordered the seizure of the old facilities in Ilba. Since the same seizure, nine young workers lost their lives on this plant. But the pattern of management is always the same. Io lavoro dal, allo stabilimento Ilva dal 97. Negli anni ci sono stati tanti incidenti, tanti morti, perché ci sono stati morti sulle gru. E questo, quando noi diciamo che quella fabbrica va chiusa totalmente, è proprio per quello, perché non esiste solo la diossina che si vede e che noi mangiamo, ma esistono tanti inquinanti, quelle sostanze che, che, che si creavano, chi le ha inalate? Io. E, e tutto il resto dove andava a finire? Nel sottosuolo, inquinamento. Io mi sono ammalato di tumore alla tiroide. E più che la questione no, del, dell'operazione che ho subito, è proprio la questione mentale che, che mi fa male, e ancora oggi mi fa male. Perché cioè, tu ti senti veramente impazzire. E dici, vabbè, io... 
io, io, io mi sono andato ad ammazzare. Convinti da sindacato e dalla politica, continuano ad entrare al lavoro. Ma che cosa si può fare? Si possono ammazzare? Sto dicendo, io personalmente sono stata lì la notte del che la radice, secondo operaio la ed era là sotto sì. l'acqua, morto lì, che non si poteva recuperare perché noi non abbiamo neanche i mezzi per tirare fuori la droga. Abbiamo aspettato una ditta veneta che venisse a recuperare la macchina e anche il corpo della persona. Le persone sono entrate a lavorare mentre noi facevamo il lavoro. È questo il sì. con il cadavere lì. Non dimentichiamo che eh, la, la, la natura e le cose che ci sono nella natura sono in dono, intanto, prima di essere proprietà privata. Beh, il capitalismo si poggia sull'idea di dominare la natura e di trarne il maggior profitto. E quello, anche Perciò. questo è in agonia, cioè purtroppo non muore mai. Ai nostri colleghi manca l'alternativa. Ecco perché noi abbiamo studiato il piano Taranto. Quell'alternativa che gli permette di abbandonare eh, questo lavoro. La possibilità di riconversione per Taranto offre che cosa? 30 anni di lavoro per 30.000 persone che si occuperanno di smantellare quella fabbrica, bonificare il sito inquinato che è sempre pari a due volte e mezza alla città di Taranto, e restituire un sito decontaminato a tutti gli, gli utilizzi sociali e uh, urbani che se ne possono fare. Lo Stato ha cominciato a parlare di messa a norma e ambientalizzazione, pur di non chiudere. È un'ulteriore promessa di un acciaio green, che però è un'operazione di solo greenwashing, per mantenere in piedi una fabbrica che è un serbatoio di voti politici, di partito, di sindacato, e di interessi diversi, che però non ha nessuna utilità. Solo un piano partecipato dal basso ne assicura che nessuno dall'alto cali altri programmi, che non tengano conto di quella che è l'unica verità, che l'impianto non può produrre mai acciaio pulito senza rischio sanitario per noi. Quindi l'unica alternativa è la chiusura, non parziale della sola area a caldo così come era cominciata, di tutta l'area che inquina anche quella a freddo, e dello smantellamento e la bonifica totale. Piano Taranto is now awaiting evaluation by the European Commission. In the meantime, the sacrificed city keeps claiming the right to healing from the noxious effects of steel monoculture as a necessary precondition and the very essence of any possible circular economy transition. Montemor o Novo is a small rural town of the Alentejo region in the south of Portugal, affected for decades by economic decline, loss of population, and the environmental effects caused by agro-industry. Here in 2015 was founded Minga Cooperative with the aim of promoting an economic renaissance based on the recovery of a rural circular economy. Minga is a cooperative that is uh, in Montemoro Novo and uh, it was created in 2015. Especially the older farmers and people with a more time range perspective, they, they see how the policies from European Union on farming especially led to a lot of unemployment, people were paid not to produce and uh, the jobs in agriculture fell, the factories and the transformation sector around agroforestry closed and so people were forced to migrate to to the cities to the coast and this is a phenomenon that is happening uh, a bit uh, all over uh, Europe and uh, this the perspective of Minga is to bring this also the south 
oriented perspective of circular economy, this broader perspective of circular economy that is not just about waste, it's about giving to the territories a life, a culture, uh, an existence that gives a future, a hope to stop the people to go away and to attract people to Montemar. And we understood that uh, there were economic problems facing the population, people had difficulties, the farmers have difficulties to sell their products, people had uh, difficulties to create their own businesses because of costs, and also there were housing problems, so people could not afford the housing. So we thought of creating a cooperative that could create income sources to the people, either by helping them to make their own business or by helping uh, them to sell their products by having a shop uh, or by helping them to develop project in, in housing, in social services, things that are associated to their needs. So that's, that was the context that uh, Minga appeared. And basically any person of Montemor can just sell any product or service to any client in Montemor, outside, whatever. But whenever they need paperwork and invoice to take care of all the bureaucracy, they can use Minga to do that. And it's much cheaper than having their own company individually. We have architects, we have plumbers, we have um, uh, translators, we have artists, we have uh, all sorts of professions inside the cooperative. From the other side, we have a shop that sells products from local producers, farmers, cosmetics producers, uh, food products of in general, uh, any so sorts of crafts. So basically, local, uh, whenever, whenever a local producer wants to sell their product, their product, they can come to the cooperative shop and sell the, in the cooperative shop. Uh, also, we supply school canteens with products from the local farmers. So we help both by the shop, by the supplying to the canteens to create an income for the local producers. We have a, a housing project and we are all in the process of, of buying land and, and buying also old buildings to uh, build from scratch or renew old buildings and give it at uh, accessible prices for, for people to live. We try to promote the cooperation in general between people and also that people start buying more local. We have a kind of internal currency between the members so we can buy from each other or go to the shop and use your own this currency to, to buy products and it, this is a way of, of incentivizing people to buy from each other. Uh, currently we are 150 members from all the sector, services, um, agriculture, uh, crafts, producers and we invoice around 1 million, a bit below 1 million euros per year, last year. And circular economy is about people buying from each other, it's about connecting people, it's about also knowledge is exchange. Because if you go and see how people used to live here, they used to live with the resources that were here. They know exactly how to produce all sorts of tools, the food they need, the textiles. So when we arrived to a territory, when we arrived here, me and other people, like we thought like we first have to learn from how people do things. We think that if we really want to produce a circular economy in a in a broad and deeper way, we should really give value to the to the ways people in different territories used to use their resources. Circular economy is about buying from each other, so create income inside the community, the money circulating through the members of that uh, territory. 
and it's about circula circulation of knowledge. So knowledge between different generations, deep people with different backgrounds, storytelling. Storytelling is a way of circulating knowledge. So, and it, it, knowledge is an economy uh, factor in itself. So, some people mention this. It's about circulating knowledge. So, and these people, in general, consider that Minga were and could give some examples of how Ming implement these circularities and in these multiple perspectives. In 2019, Minga started sharing his expertise by offering courses and consultancy to sustain new cooperatives. Since 2002, it organizes the annual Forum of Integral Cooperatives, where organizations coming from all over Portugal meet with the aim of creating synergies and developing new circular economy projects. Consumption of electric and electronic equipment and the subsequent generation of waste has substantially increased in the last decades and will likely continue to rise worldwide. The presence of a large amount of scrap coming from all over the world and a growing waste market brought many informal workers to the big cities of Ghana from the north and rural areas of the country. The Aboabo Market is a waste management site in Kumasi, Ghana's second largest city. Here, almost 1,000 people live on the dismantling and resale of waste to the international buyers, demanding more and more electronic parts and scrap metals from electrical and electronic equipment. This part of Kumasi, it is a Zongo dominated area. What I mean by Zongo is people of different origin or people of different tribes who have traveled from different parts of Ghana and come and settle in Kumasi here. All the people living around this area are either engaged in scrap business or they engage in a headquarter. You see the females carrying headpants around. If you have a load, and you want a transport, they can carry it on their head for you. And we have the men engaged in the buying and selling of scrap materials. We have half people who are involved in the scrap business who are not genuine scrap dealers, but thieves. So we decided to come together and form a group so that the city authorities will be aware of us Let's say police might stop you on your way and ask you, hey, my friend, where did you get this engine from? You tell the police officer, oh, I went and bought it at this place. So, so, so and so sell it to me. Then the police will now demand uh, something like receipt. That proves that the owner really sold the thing to you. But an individual who just went and replaced his car engine cannot give you a receipt for... Um, for a, a, a scrap engine. If you go and buy scraps, you, you may have car battery in it, you may have aluminium in it, you may have e-waste. In Ghana here, we import used motorbikes from China and Japan. We import 
uh, used cars from Germany, we import used cars from Korea, a lot, a whole lot of things, even used computers we import and even mobile phones, we bring it to Ghana here. And some of these things, before they get here, it is completely damaged. So some people come here to buy the scraps and go and reuse it again. Whilst other people also ship it back abroad. You know, uh, I am not that, uh, I am not an expert in computer, but now that semiconductor business is now booming. A lot of companies come down here to buy computer motherboards. Then they will send it back to Europe for recycling again. We are a registered association consisting of more than 600 members. And out of these 600 members, we have some members that we call executive members. So these executive members make decisions for the 600 registered members. I am the financial secretary. So I am part of the decision-making body of. Well, we meet every Friday. If you have an identification from Kumasi Scrap Dealers Association, it gives you guarantee to move to wherever in Kumasi here you want to go for your scrap business. This kind of business, the scrap business, we, we are engaging with dangerous materials. We are, in the, we are engaging with a, a lot of electronic waste. And these electronic waste have some kind of um, hazardous components in it. So these NGOs have had uh, numerous training with us to uh, train us uh, to build our capacity on how to handle these dangerous chemicals so that it will not have a direct impact on our lives and then the environment. The number of Ghanaian scrap workers associations is rising very fast, involving people from the growing urban population. Their everyday struggle against social stigma is also aimed to improve the inclusion of waste pickers and recyclers in a more sustainable and healthy work environment. Towards a socially and environmentally just circular economy transition path. The entire South African agricultural sector confronts changed weather patterns, experiences the fragility of extended value chains, and fears the brimming social discontent that derives from decades of extreme inequality and economic exclusion. A farm called Lower Land, located on the banks of the Orange River in the arid lands of the Northern Cape, moves toward regenerative practices. Lowerland's move toward regenerative practices against the backdrop of a changing geopolitical environment and dramatic climate change. It can be seen as a prototype of a new mode of agricultural enterprise in South Africa and a harbinger of a future system in harmony with nature and society. The size that we operate here at the moment is about 150 hectares that's irrigated, certified organic and then about 100 that's still in conversion where we're planting lucerne now and then uh, just so we can we're not ready for that complexity so we're using lucerne to just get the soil ready for when we can start planting more intensive crops there uh, we're about 30 people permanently working here of that 30 uh, between 5 and 15 will be interns uh, from mostly from south africa graduates from colleges uh, and every now and then an uh, international intern. Um, then future farmers also send us younger guys who want to get into farming but they haven't studied. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of people coming and going which I think is part of our, uh, our operation. So we always get new ideas, new people coming and if people felt that they learned enough here then they can go and uh, hopefully do something similar in other places. We do rotations with uh, short season or long season annual cover crops where our animals rotate on 
and then we will have some perennial cover crops also. So after about two or three years of uh, short season cover crops and cash crops, we go back into a perennial and pecan nuts, and we have a six hectares of pecan nuts also. Our animals are a massive part of our operation in terms of the impact they have on the fertility, and because we can't use chemicals and um, any chemical fertilizers, we literally use the animals to do all that work for us. Our vision is to supply uh, a basket full of nutritious produce to the end consumer um, at, a, at a price that is affordable, at great value, uh, and also in a way that we can regenerate our soils, uh, our environment, and also the social environment in the area. We are in an area that gets around 250 millimeters of water in a year average and uh, that would be uh, arid area so water is very important for us so on uh, our pastures we give 30 percent on average less water than our neighbors uh, we go even further and we monitor the soil moisture biological farming methods you would save better moisture in your soil because you establish that mycorrhizal fungi, you establish your, your um, earthworms moving in the soil that use that moisture that allow it to capture and to stay there on your, on your uh, uh, soil and not for the moisture just to run away and to go below, below everything. We try to operate on human scale, uh, we try to uh, uplift people, bring in uh, um, people to run certain enterprises um, as we are a complex operation, people really need to take ownership of what they are doing. The conventional model of farming, like we all learn when we study agriculture, is to, to be uh, specialized and to optimize for one thing. You will have specialized inputs with people that will sell the inputs to you. Those inputs will generally come from overseas and be imported to South Africa and you will optimize your crop and you will harvest and, and a lot of it will be sold off as a commodity and some of it exported again. You can use the animals to go eat the pasture on the field where you planted it, meaning you don't need to cut the pasture, you don't need to bail it, you don't need to drive it out of the field, you don't need to feed it through a feeding uh, mixer. Uh, so everything happens on the field. So you use the animals for what they were born to do. So you use the ruminants to walk with their legs onto the pasture. You let them have a proper impact on the day leave the manure and the urine there for fert fertilizing the soil and you move them on to the next camp. So you break down the barriers between different farming systems and you integrate everything. I think as soon as you break down that barrier, then there's a sense of pride in what you do because you get feedback, good and bad, every day. Um, and I think once you've changed your, or for me, once I've changed my, my thinking from commodity to actual product, you know, you see it as being healthy, you see it as improving people's lives. Um, I, that just completely changed my way of thinking. We do about nine hectares of wine grapes, uh, but wine is, uh, most of our wine goes into bottle. Some is exported, mostly sold local. Um, then we do organic maize. Then we do wheat, we do rye. Uh, if you look at wheat, we do three or four different varieties. All of it goes into flour. Uh, we sell organic flour. We mill it with a stone ground on the farm. Uh, we set up our bakery now, so we bake sourdough once a week. 
And the long plan is that we will start selling sourdough frozen also to our clients. With this farming system, uh, we are quite focused to develop leadership development skills, uh, more or less that you manage basically yourself. Uh, what I like about this operation, you can ease and speak your mind and, and apply your management skills more or less with a team that work best for you instead of most companies where we practice micromanagement which is, can be quite stressful because you're just executing a program that is enforced upon a manager or team leader and say you need to execute this at times when you arrive here and you say oh i'm not used to this operation because the system taught us maybe differently but on this operation you have literally like an a brother brother keeper uh, operation on this with with your farmer with your manager with your boss basically so you work in palm perfect harmony so the way we th do things on this farm is uh, very different than what conventional farms are doing apart from the organic and the regenerative space our farm are also running on a system of circular economy and where we can intermanage ourselves and run our own projects and our own programs in south africa as you know we have a bad history about um, apartheid and people being shoved aside and for me it's very important to help educate the farmers of the future to help put the guys out there to get people educated and skilled up maybe we're not always 100 percent perfect but at the end of the day we all learn by making mistakes and that is how Loverland functions. It allows you to make mistakes and it also gives you a full net where it can support you and where it can go and say, you know what, I think if you do this differently, you're going to have better results. I think our leadership is, is, is more like bottom up, meaning that everyone plans their own week. and. Um, when we come to work on Monday, you already know what you want to do this week. It's not like somebody's going to tell you what to do. We want to make things better. You want to make the food better. You want to make people healthy. You want to uh, get the best out of people. Let people reach their potential. Get, let them work if they want to work. Let them be managers if they think they can manage. Let them bake bread if they want to bake bread. Uh, that's a big part of our operation to make sure that uh, integrity of the product and the way we farm and stay intact with the manufacturing and the storing and the uh, logistics. So in the long term, it's so many opportunities for us to create more work on the farm, to create more jobs and to bring all the manufacturing back to the farm. Through the narration of these four different case studies from Global North and South, this documentary shows examples about both systemic barriers and powerful enablers to an inclusive, sustainable and socially just transition to a circular economy. In the belief that these stories can enliven the debate on the sustainable and democratic transformation of our society.